it is a common experience to relive the events of a loved one's life in anticipation of an anniversary of their death. Whether a loved one was sick or died suddenly, our minds and sometimes even our bodies relive the events leading up to their death. <coughs> and so Palm Sunday is that for the Christian tradition, a remembering, a reliving of the events that led up to Jesus' death. We join in the procession today as we wave our branches and proclaim our Jesus, our praise of Jesus. And at, at this point, it's quite easy, it would be easy, to skip to next Sunday, Easter, because the story in between is so uncomfortable. Suffering and death is uncomfortable. Death can feel like a dark and lonely path. When we remember a death of a loved one, we can be fraught with questions. Did I, did we, did they make the right decisions? Would it have turned out differently if they would have made a different choice, if we would have made a different choice? These are natural and normal questions and thoughts to experience in a time of remembrance. What we need to remind ourselves is that we make the best decisions with God's help. Would Jesus have done it the same way had he known of the exact events that would occur by the end of the week? It is very likely he did know that the situation was ripe for clashing and that there would be a threat soon to his life. Jesus was led all throughout his life by God's Spirit to act and speak into the political and religious reality of the day and to embody a fuller reality of God's love and peace. And for that, I don't think he would have done anything differently. What we see in today's passage is Jesus doing what Jesus did. He made intentional decisions through his ministry of how he was going to live God's love more fully to humanity. He was going to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, an annual ritual to remember God's deliverance to the people of Israel. Growing up, Jesus was accustomed to making this pilgrimage with his family annually. This is the same pilgrimage that his family had made when he was 12 years old, documented in Luke earlier, when he was lost and then found again by his parents listening to the priests in the temple. He would have become accustomed to the sights, sounds, and smells of a festival like this. Jesus would have also noted the cultural and religious changes over time. John's maternal great-grandparents acquired a property in the 1950s in the little community of Pinecraft, in Sarasota, Florida. Our family, the fourth generation, has made this a beloved vacation spot. Pinecraft is known most by being a popular vacation destination for the Amish, drawing from various communities from the East and Midwest regions. A couple of weeks ago, our family returned for another visit this being my eighth time there, I'm noticing the things that seem to be preserved by time, like the local ice cream shop, the adult tricycles that are the main mode of transportation in the community, some of the old cottages, one of them being ours, 
and the local shuffleboard courts in the park that fill with players in the afternoons. I also am noticing the changes. Like when an old home is torn down and replaced by a new one. Or the adult tricycles becoming electric adult tricycles as they zip around the streets. Now I clearly understand this is not the same kind of pilgrimage Jesus was making. For perhaps the few religious things about Pinecraft are the Amish Meeting House, the tourist Mennonite Church, and the regularity in which people make the trip there. However, the point I want to make is that changes are noticeable. If you've ever returned to your hometown, or a repeat vacation or retreat destination, you notice how things change. I imagine it was the same for Jesus. Jerusalem was not the same. Theologian Marcus Borg notes contextually that the feast of the Passover at this time had an increasing militarized Roman presence in the city and around the temple. Passover had become a time when riots and demonstrations would occur against the Roman rule. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, would make a point to enter Jerusalem with a cavalry of horses, soldiers decked with armor and weapons to be a visible presence and enforce order. I suspect Jesus would have been aware of this practice that had been intensifying over time. And having known the Hebrew scriptures well, Jesus chose to enact Zechariah's prophecy. He made plans to ride into Jerusalem on a young colt, sending a different message with a mass of fellow pilgrims. The same day Pilate rode into the city from the west, Jesus rode in on a colt from the east. Two different rulers, two different directions, two different messages. Jesus was surrounded by his followers who took their cloaks, laid them on the, the, col the back of the colt, laid them before him as he went into, onto the path, naming with their actions that this was a royal procession. People gathered branches available to them and waved them, declaring Jesus as king. These were the followers that were healed, that saw him healed and experienced the transformation with Jesus' teaching. They were making the pilgrimage together, celebrating God's act of deliverance for their people. Their pronouncement was coming from their depths of healed anguish and pain. Their cries were coming from Jesus' forgiveness and love, giving them a place to belong instead of the marginalized status that some of them would have had in their society. Jesus gave them hope, worth, and empowered them to raise their voices. And Jesus' action was being noticed, and it was, a call, and it was calling attention to all of those around. I can be hard and downright judgmental of the Pharisees. However, in this instance, I have some empathy towards them. They were trying to navigate some tough social and religious realities. They were trying to provide religious guidance and communicate to government on their religious community's behalf. 
They worked hard at striking deals or at the least negotiating with the, the authorities in order to maintain the rights of the Jews in their time. They were trying to keep things from getting worse, like no more taxes or the ever-increasing oppressive restrictions that they were facing and infringement on land rights. As long as there weren't major demonstrations or disruptions, then maybe the status quo would be easier to maintain. So Jesus was not making things easy. The shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven, called attention and disturbance. Pharisees asked Jesus for help. Could you just please keep them a little quiet, they requested. But Jesus wouldn't have it. If they don't cry out, the stones will. Creation itself will cry out. It reminds me of Romans 8, when Paul writes of the whole creation groaning as it waits for redemption. Jesus names that the created order will itself communicate if humanity won't. In a time of religious and political injustice, Jesus was led to demonstrate for many to see God's different reign and exhibition of power. Jesus chose this time for this subversive act, one of humble boldness, to once again juxtapose ways of living out power, one of peace to that of force, one of persuasion to that of coercion, one of service to that of oppression. I return to Pinecraft. An adjacent park I mentioned has eight meticulously maintained shuffleboard courts. Daily, people from the community, the Pinecraft community, gather to play together. And I, when I watched this pastime of the various matches that were being played, I was struck by how many patterns of dress, head coverings, bonnets, trousers, suspenders, haircuts, and styles of beards were represented there. I could tell there were a number of Amish communities represented. They may have had separate worshiping communities from which they were coming from, but the courts became a place where friends were made, regardless of the differences they, have, they may have. Our family jokes about what happens in Pinecraft stays in Pinecraft. But maybe it's a safe place where it was acceptable to establish relationships across boundaries. There was an act of humanizing the other. I believe any place we are willing to engage in relationships with people different from ourselves, we are making a choice to humanize the other, which can be seen as a subversive choice in our dehumanizing culture. A few months ago, our congregation was involved in a collaborative effort to send a team of people to the U.S.-Mexico border. In their reporting and sharing with us, we heard initiatives that are going on locally that are involved in supporting the immigrant population right here. This is a subversive choice in the face of demonization and fear. Faith in Action, an organization in this community with people of faith speaking and highlighting injustices in our community. This year, the focus was on the injustices 
within the system of incarceration. This group is making a subversive choice to speak into the oppressive power, humanizing the inmates and their families. Simply gathering here as a faith community to nurture our relationship with God and with one another is a subversive act in our individualistically focused society. I realize using the word subversive is quite strong. And yet, Jesus' message is not of this world. The messages we send when we act out of our faith, filled passions, often bucks the system. It stirs things up, or at the very minimum, speaks a different message. My examples of how this community is involved in subversive acts are by no means an exhaustive list, nor am I advocating you to go out and make waves simply to call attention to yourself or an issue. I'm rather inviting us into a week of contemplation, of remembrance, and then out of it may grow action. As we remember Jesus' procession into Jerusalem, may we consider how Jesus' subversive choice speaks to us today. Where are we in being invited to be a presence of peace in the face of power and dominance? Where are we invited into conversation with those for whom we have differences? Where are we being invited into our, in our places of influence to act out of a place of servanthood? We join in the procession crying out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And in so doing, Be grounded in God's love and bold in faith as we relive the coming days.